Now, if this question hasn't occurred to you yet, it would have eventually. Basically, why do we want to use large pages that are two megabytes, four megabytes, or one gigabyte big, instead of just everything always being a four kilobyte page? Well, from this information in the November 2008 edition of the Intel manual, which doesn't seem to be present in the 2020 version anymore, it says that a typical example of mixing four kilobyte and four megabyte pages is to place the operating system or executive's kernel into a large page to reduce TLB misses and thus improve overall system performance. Processor maintains four megabyte page entries and four kilobyte page entries in separate TLBs. So placing code that is often used, such as the kernel, in a larger page frees up four kilobyte page TLB entries for application programs and tasks. So the basic answer is using larger pages improves performance, especially because you might have a big blob of memory, such as an operating systems kernel, that's going to be always the same. It's not self-modifying or anything like that. And therefore, by putting it in a cache so that the virtual to physical translation is easily looked up every time you transition from user space to kernel space, such as while doing a system call, this will mean that you don't have to go out and walk the page tables in memory, so it'll be significantly faster. So let's go ahead and look at what the TLB is and why this improves performance. So back to this Wikipedia page that we had mentioned briefly before, we said that virtual addresses come nominally from the CPU, and the MMU is responsible for walking page tables and translating virtual addresses into physical addresses that it puts out to RAM, but there is this side lookup with the TLB, the translation look aside buffer, which is a cache of virtual to physical translations. So basically the point is every, you know, remember the memory hierarchy attempts to go out to RAM are more costly than just using local caches or using local registers. And so because a page table itself is out in RAM, if there's some address in physical memory like a kernel you're going to access very frequently, you want to not have to walk a page table just to find where the kernel is in physical RAM. So basically the TLB improves performance because the MMU can just consult the tables and it can try different sizes and it can say, okay, for this virtual address, does it exist in the four kilobyte TLB? No. Does it exist in the four megabyte TLB? Yes. Okay, now that I see it exists in the four, kilo, four megabyte TLB, then I can just take the bottom 22 bits of the address and or it on to whatever translation gets looked up from the cache. And so essentially different TLB sizes can be used in order to, so two and four megabyte are never actually used at the same time. Uh, it's two megabyte for the 64 bit stuff we care about, care about. It was four megabyte back in the old 32 bit physical address extensions that we didn't really cover in this class. So for all intents and purposes, there's just kind of, you know, three possible caches that uh, have to be looked up in. And so once the MMU determines that it does exist in a cache, once it gets a hit on a cache for the virtual address, then it can just say, okay, I'm going to take the bottom 12 bits, the bottom 22 bits, the bottom 30 bits, and just or those together with the particular physical address that it got out of the cache. So in some sense, you can think of the TLB trying to achieve the same goal that we saw back in the segmentation registers where they had a hidden portion and the whole point was to say, we don't want to look up things from tables like the GDT all the time. Just here, the TLB is saying, we don't want to look up things from the page tables all the time. But whereas the segmentation was relatively simple because it was not all sorts of different types of translations, it's just something that's sort of set up once, page tables are much more complicated. They're getting swapped around between different processes all the time. So they behave more like real caches in that they have you know, notions of associativity if you've ever you know, studied real caches. And if you don't, it doesn't matter. All that matters is this simple sort of picture that I've given to give you a notion of what it means. So if you had, say, a 32-bit linear address and the address was 4F007700, then it would basically take the top part, the 4F007, it would try to find it in a TLB, could be the 4 kilobyte TLB, could be the 4 megabyte TLB, and if it gets a hit in the TLB, then it says, okay, this virtual address corresponds to this physical address. And then it's just going to or that together with this 700, and so virtual address 4F007700 turns into too bad 1000, 
700 because the base of the thing is 1000 and then adding in the 700 offset gives you the location that it's trying to access. So basically a TLB is a very simple virtual page number to physical frame number lookup table. It's more complicated, but that's, that's all you really have to think of it as. Now, one of the behaviors of the TLB is that whenever CR3 is set to a new value, which as a reminder, only ring zero can move a value into CR3, whenever that happens, all TLB entries which are not marked as global are flushed. So we had just very briefly hit on the global flag and we just said, oh, that's gonna matter later on for caching and stuff. And here is where it finally matters. So basically, in these entries, if they had the global bit set, what it means is they essentially will survive a context switch. It means when you when you swap from notepad.exe to you know, svchost.exe, if some particular area of memory was marked as global, that translation of virtual to physical memory will remain the same in the TLB, and therefore any attempts to look up memory at that particular virtual address will go to the same physical address, even though you've just actually swapped processes, swapped page tables, and everything else. So if, that, if, if page table entries or a virtual to physical translation survive in the TLB between context switches, you need some way to actually kick them out. And the way that they get kicked out is with a new assembly instruction, the invalidate page instruction. So basically you could have some global area of memory. The most likely case would be something like the two megabyte portion for the kernel because the uh, operating system would like the you know, kernel virtual to physical address translation to be exactly the same between all the different processes because they're going to uh, because they're all going to see, you know, the same sort of entry points when they have system calls. And so that's just an optimization thing, albeit an optimization thing that's had to be changed a little bit because of meltdown mitigations. But notionally, you can imagine that, you know, the kernel is just sitting around at the same virtual to physical translation between different processes. So what happens if you want to, you know, force and kick out that particular kernel virtual to physical translation? the kernel itself would have to use the invalidate page instruction to force something out of the TLB. Now again, as alluded to in the quote from the 2008 manuals, there are multiple types of TLBs for different sizes. Uh, there's also different types for data access versus instruction access. So data TLBs, DTLBs, and instruction TLBs, ITLBs. So basically for data TLBs, if you look at the latest uh, chips, you would see that it could have you know, up to six different types of TLBs. You could have data TLBs for four kilobyte access, two or four megabyte access, and one gigabyte access. You could have instruction TLBs for four kilobyte or two or four megabyte. Don't seem to have any TLBs currently defined in the manuals for the notion of one gigabyte pages. So that means that basically Intel is assuming that no one's trying to map one gigabyte of a blob into memory that always just sticks around, which is accurate as of today. And then finally, there's the notion of shared TLB or level two TLB, which can actually be shared between the instruction and data TLBs. So different Intel chips actually have different caches, different number of entries and everything else. And so you actually have to look up what's supported on a particular piece of hardware. So for instance, right now, I'm doing this class on an Intel i9-9980HK from my last generation of x86 based MacBook Pros. So when I looked up the information with CPU ID, I found that it says it has 64 four kilobyte entries in the data TLB and 32 two slash four megabyte entries and four one gigabyte entries. It also has 64 four kilobyte ITLB entries and eight two slash four ITLB entries. But what was interesting was when I looked at this exact slide from my previous slides on my much older MacBook Pro, it said it had 256 four kilobyte entries and 128 four kilobyte entries for DNI TLBs. So what gives? Like I was, you know, very sad. I said, why is my hardware going backwards? Well, the answer is because my hardware is actually adding the shared TLB, that level two TLB, which gives me 1,536 four slash two megabyte entries and 16 one gigabyte entries. So 
All right, well, I have slightly less, you know, well, because it's a shared TLB, uh, it can be shared between D and I. So really I have way more D TLBs and I TLBs than I would previously have, so it's all good. And that brings us to our mini lab. I want you to go edit your CPU ID and set the EAX equal to two, and then print out all of the EAX, CBX, ECX, EDX values, and go into the manual, look at table 312 in the CPU ID instruction page, and translate what your entries are saying. Basically, it's gonna be a bunch of bytes, and each of those bytes is telling you something about what you support in terms of TLBs and also other caching types.